Good evening, everyone. I'm Lauren, and this is your virtual tour with the Scotch Whiskey Experience brought to you by Tickets Awakening Weeks. So for those of you who don't know, Tickets Awakening Weeks is a six-week celebration of the reopening of, mu of museums and attractions in six countries around the world. And the venues participating in Awakening Weeks have worked day and night to reimagine their experiences and introduce new hygiene measures to make sure that it's safe for you to visit again. They're also rolling up the welcome mat for those of us who aren't able to travel yet with these online experiences. So before I hand over to our presenter for this afternoon, they're just a couple of, well, this evening, they're just a couple of logistics to take care of. Um, so if you have any questions for our presenter, you can submit them through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen in the center of the Zoom window. Um, there'll be a Q&A at the end of the experience, so please feel free to send through your questions and we'll try and answer as many as possible at the end of the session. Uh, you can also vote on your favorite questions by giving them a thumbs up, and so that way we can ask the best questions first. Um, this is a Zoom webinar, as you may have realized, so your camera won't be on, but you can use the chat function, function to communicate with your fellow attendees and with the speaker. Um, you can also share in the chat where you're joining us from, you can share your reactions during the session, um, and you can do that in the chat by messaging all panelists and attendees. If at some point during the session you have any technical difficulties, you can use the chat option to send a message just to the panelists and we'll try and help you out. If it's an audio issue, sometimes it helps to just leave and then rejoin again. Um, finally, this presentation is going to be recorded and we'll be sending the recording to all of our registrants in the coming weeks. Uh, so without any further ado, I'm happy to hand over this um, virtual experience to our host. Julie Trevison Hunter is going to transport us to the world of the Scotch Whiskey Experience. Julie, please take it away. Thank you. Well, a very, very warm welcome to Edinburgh's Castle Hill. Um, we're right in the centre of Edinburgh here, where um, my neighbour behind me, if you can see on this slightly dreary evening, um, is Edinburgh Castle. So uh, I've been working here at Scotch Whiskey Experience for 25 years now with a brilliant team of colleagues who've been welcoming visitors from all over the world since 1988. So I'm delighted to take you on a virtual tour this evening. We're going to wander through the building, firstly having a look at some of the measures that we've put in place at the moment to make people feel very safe and comfortable while they rejoin us and start going out again and having fun again here in Edinburgh. And then I'll be taking a seat in the whiskey collection and telling you some tales from the Scotch whiskey world with a focus on reawakening and reopening and some of the resilience that we're having to show now uh, that the whiskey industry has shown through the centuries. So first of all, let me just turn you around and um, show you a little bit about the building where we are here. So here we are on Castle Hill, there's Edinburgh Castle right up at the top there. And this is us right next door here in the Scotch Whiskey Experience. Now, as you arrive at the building, we have our welcome point here. Uh, we have a policy of uh, symptom-free entry. And that means that if anyone has any symptoms of exhibiting between the time that they have booked a ticket and when they're due to come along, we will offer people a full refund, um, no questions asked. As we enter the building here, um, we have probably gone a little bit over top with the sanitizer points. At every entrance point to the building, we have sanitizer. And as we move around the building uh, from one area to the other, there's the option to use sanitizer there as well. Uh, here's Paula, my wonderful colleague of many, many years. Um, we have these screens at each of our points, which are obviously transparent. I'm not sure how well that's coming across in this video here. Um, these hygiene screens, every single one of our till points, and obviously our team are all wearing masks at the moment, as are all of our visitors. As we move around the building here, and um, let me tell you a little bit more about the things that we're doing. So we have a morning briefing for all of our team that goes alongside our daily deep clean. Um, then as we move around the building, we have a guided tour. So the guided tour takes around about one hour for people to complete and you do move around the building here. So we're doing cleaning as we go along every day, things like the banisters here, any touch points or handles that people might be using, that happens frequently and vigorously uh, all day long from the open. There's Pete the cat, he's just a little 
treat for our uh, families that come along there. And as we move into the first fully guided part of the tour, our sense of Scotland room, I'll just tell you a little bit about the reduced capacities that we have at the moment. So ordinarily our capacity for our tours is 25 visitors, but at the moment we have reduced that capacity to just 12 visitors. So we can have physical distancing, which at the moment for visitor attractions here in Scotland is two meters. So a meter in our shop, in our bar and in our restaurant, but two meters up here in the attraction. I'm going to turn you around again to tell you a little bit about this beautiful area that we are in here. So this is our sense of Scotland room, where we introduce to our visitors the beautiful whisky producing regions of Scotland. So we begin downstairs with our barrel ride, which takes people through how single malt Scotch whisky is produced. We'll tell you a little bit about how the production, the ingredients and the casks influence the flavour of Scotch whisky. But one of the key things, of course, is the climate, the geography and the weather. And in that way, every whisky producing region also really contributes flavour and character to the whisky. So in this area here, you can see our lovely panoramic room where we take people on a beautiful journey through Scotland's five Scotch whisky producing regions, where they learn a little bit about the magic that happens in each of these regions as they contribute the flavour and the character of that area to the whisky itself. Let me just turn you around and take you through the next part of the tour. So we move from the sense of Scotland room to what's known as our blenders sample room. Now this is a recreation of an 1870s blenders sample room where the alchemy really started taking place of the creation of blended Scotch whisky, which I'll tell you a little bit more about later on. But in this area here, our guide will go through a presentation and tell people a lot about how those blends were created and became so iconic and so famous. Hold your breath now, we're going through to what I believe is Edinburgh's most beautiful, stunning and spectacular room. This is our whisky vault, um, the Diageo Clive Vida's Scotch whisky collection. This is without doubt the most beautiful and stunning collection of Scotch whisky in the world um, and indeed one of the biggest unopened collections on view to the public. Everybody that takes any kind of our tours has the opportunity to wander through the collection and to try a dram here and very shortly I'll be taking a seat with you in the whisky collection to tell you a little bit more about it and about the stories of Scotch whisky. Here we have two of our oldest bottles, which there's lots of reflections in the glass, but you might be able to see. So we have bottles that date back to the late 1800s and the beginning of the 1900s. Um, we have some bottles that were absolutely unique, that were only ever bottled once, maybe 50 or 60 bottles made, and um, some really unusual collector's pieces as well. So those stories are things that we share with visitors as they visit this stunningly beautiful whisky collection. Now, it may surprise some people to know that um, over 90% of the whisky which is produced here in Scotland is in fact sold in blended Scotch whisky. And this whisky collection pretty much mirrors that. So the wall here that you're seeing is our single malt wall, which is split up according to its whisky regions. And almost all of the rest of the collection is blended Scotch whisky, which we have put together alphabetically. So there's the weird and the wonderful, the unusual, um, some interesting decanters there, um, and some fantastic bottles next door in our bar as well as the final part of it. So having given you a little insight into this beautiful collection, which I hope people will come back and uh, have the opportunity to have a look at themselves, I am now going to switch around so you can uh, see me again and grab a dram and a seat, if you'll give me a second to put myself in the right position, um, and tell you about some of the stories of the whiskey world that I think really relate beautifully to this time that we're in of reopening of our attractions particularly, um, but the whole hospitality section, 
and this reawakening as well as people begin to start going out again and um, finding the confidence to visit new venues to go to places they've been in the past but also to see places they've, they've never seen again and when I was thinking about this I thought actually there are so many beautiful stories from the world of Scotch whisky that that really really resonate with that and um, this lovely awakening campaign that tickets are running this week just seemed a beautiful way to share some of those stories with you. Um, so I'm gonna grab myself a dram and also a glass of water and, um, and tell you some of those lovely stories that we have. So the Scotch whiskey industry has, I think, a slightly different perspective on things compared to many other industries. And one of the reasons for that is, um, is quite simply due to time. If you imagine that you create um, some single malt today at the distillery as it drips slowly from the pot still and is gathered ready to be put in the cask, by law, Scotch whisky has to be matured in Scotland for three years and one day before it can even be called Scotch whisky. Now, this means that anything being bottled at all has to be held here for quite a number of years. Um, if you're looking to make a quick buck, the Scotch whisky industry is not one to get into. Um, but over the generations, obviously, people have realized that maturing Scotch whisky for longer than that minimum period improves the flavor and the character of the whisky. So most single malts, if you're familiar with them, you'll know are bottled usually a minimum of 10 or 12 years, some of them 15, 18, 21 years. And um, if you pop down to our whisky shop, um, plenty of people will take a photo of our most expensive whiskies, which are 50 years old. So a long time passes from the day that the Scotch whisky is first produced to the day that it's finally bottled and then consumed. And in the case of this whisky collection here, if you're a collector, you buy the bottle and then you keep it for potentially decades as well. By the way, it doesn't go off in the bottle. It's not like wine. So once it's in the bottle and it's sealed, should you wish to, you can keep it as long as you want. So there's a bit of a different perspective on Scotch whisky. Um, it's a very, very family-dominated industry, it's in spite of the fact that many, many of the distilleries are owned by very large multinational companies now. They're scattered all over Scotland in the most rural um, of areas. And this means that the production still tends to take place by the families who have lived there for many generations. So it is unusual to find a distillery where the people that are working there are not working in the footsteps of their relatives that worked there before them, generations prior to that. The whiskey that you're making today, therefore, is potentially going to lie in the casks and be looked after and be bottled by your son or your grandson. Um, and that approach to Scotch whisky and the length of time it takes to lie there gives a very long-term approach to how you view the industry and how you view the world and how you view life. So quick turnarounds, quick decisions, the things that we're all having to do just now, the way that everybody um, watches the news and consumes it minute by minute as the day goes by and changes that happen so quickly, um, creates quite a, a sort of stressful backdrop to life. And the Scotch whisky industry for me is just the antithesis of that. It's, it's quite the opposite because everything has to be long term. Everything has to be about planning for the future. The amount of whisky you make today is based on your guess and your plan for how much you might sell in five, 10 or 15 years time. So everybody's constantly looking far into the future. And having a long-term approach just seems to be a beautiful, gentle balance. The other thing, of course, is the fact that whisky is made quite rurally. And the pace of life in these rural locations of Scotland is quite different to the cities, even compared to Edinburgh and Glasgow, which are not enormous cities. But when you travel up north and you wander around the distilleries and you visit these sort of communities, the pace of life is just incredibly slow. And again, I think in these times here, that's something that's beautiful to, to consider. So I think this is a really hugely important thing to, to think about in these times that we're in at the moment. Now, the Scotch whisky industry has had to be very resilient over the years, as many industries have. And one of the first things I'd like to talk about is the roots of the Scotch whisky industry, where things have adapted and changed 
And now so many people and so many businesses and so many jobs are adapting and changing. Everybody talks about the new norm, how things have changed, how we'll have to change our ways of thinking, change our ways of working, change our ways of living. And the Scotch whisky industry is a really great and inspirational example of how that has happened. So let's go back to the very, very first mention of Scotch whisky, which goes back to 1494. Um, it wasn't a distillery that was mentioned. The exchequer rolls, the tax records in Scotland, talk about eight bowls of malt, a weight of malted barley, being supplied to Friar John Corr for the production of aqua vitae. And back in 1494, that was the very, very earliest version of our Scotch whisky. So it was being made um, in a monastery across the water from Edinburgh, over the beautiful River Forth, over one of the iconic bridges that span that river, um, at Lindor's Abbey, close to St Andrews. So there was many abbeys uh, and many convents in the area of Fife, which was the kingdom of Fife. And uh, Lindor's Abbey is the first one that's referenced as ever producing aqua vitae that then became Scotch whisky. This is where Scotch actually got its name from. So aqua vitae uh, is the Latin meaning the water of life. In Gaelic, which is a traditional language of, uh, of much of Scotland, uh, the Latin translates to uscava, and uscava, meaning the water of life, then becomes anglicised a little bit and becomes the word whisky. Uh, you may note that Scotch whisky is spelt with no e, but our cousins across the water in Ireland, who are also producing whisky in their monasteries at the time, um, the spelling was slightly different and they use an e in whisky. So this is one of the questions we get asked all the time. Um, American and Irish whisky have an e in them and Scotch whisky and many other countries um, do not have the E. So both are correct, it just depends which country you're talking about. So a big change then from producing whisky in monasteries, where it wasn't produced to be drunk socially, it was produced uh, to preserve things and also for its medicinal properties. And there's lots of evidence through the centuries of the perceived medicinal properties of aqua vitae um, and Scotch whisky. The distillery at Lindor's Abbey was built only a few years ago. So from those monastic roots, which are now the ruins of the old um, abbey at Lindor's, there's now a new distillery. So there's been a huge resurgence in the building of distilleries here in Scotland in the last 10 years. And one of them is at Lindor's Abbey. So for anybody that loves a bit of history and a bit of culture and even a bit of archaeology wandering around the ruins, that's one of the most beautiful places to visit as you head to the north coast of Fife and the estuary of the Firth of Tay. So change happens in the industry. We've moved from being a monastery to being a, a whisky distillery over 500 years later. Another one close to Edinburgh, um, which if you're a whisky collector, you, the name rings a bell, and if you find one of those elusive bottles at auction, you'll want to buy one, is St Magdalene's Distillery, which is located again just up the River Forth, um, not terribly far from Edinburgh. Now, St Magdalene's was located in another royal borough of Linlithgow, and it was originally a convent and then a hospital, and then many centuries later on the same site, a distillery was built. So there's many, many different places in Scotland where distillation has only evolved much, much later and beyond previous industries taking place. I'm going to jump forward a little bit in history now and tell you a little bit about blended Scotch whisky. We previously passed through our recreation of that 1870s blenders sample room. Now, about 200 years ago, Irish whisky dominated the marketplace. It was much milder and much lighter than Scotch whisky. Uh, Scotch was very fiery. It was very inconsistent. And from bottle to bottle, you would never really get the same flavor and character. In the mid 1800s, a new way of producing whisky was invented, part of the Industrial Revolution and they invented a continuous still and a much faster way of producing whiskey um, and started using, in addition to malted barley, also different cereals to create the whiskey. 
as well. Now this created a second type of whiskey. So for centuries and centuries, we've been creating single malt Scotch whiskey. And this second kind of whiskey invented in round about 1850 is called grain whiskey, made of a combination of different grains. So single malt, malted barley, grain whiskey, a mixture of different. Now, you never really find grain whiskey bottled on its own. That wasn't ever really its purpose. But what happened was people very quickly realized that this exceptionally light style of whiskey, perhaps even a little too light on its own, was the ideal base for blending single malts on top. So in a bottle of blended whiskey, you'll typically find about 70 to 80% grain whiskey. And the remainder will be a mixture of many different kinds of single malts. And as I mentioned before, when we entered the whiskey collection here, over 90% of scotch sold throughout the world and in the UK as well um, is blended scotch whiskey. So it's a smoother and more consistent style of whiskey. It's lighter in palate. And when we first started making that whiskey, Round about 1870, 1880, that's when Scotch whisky went global. So we were fortunate in the sense that it was a very, very small local industry. So whisky at that time was sold in the licensed grocers' stores. Those grocers were very accomplished and experienced at blending tea, which had become incredibly popular throughout the whole of the United Kingdom. And they just turned that skill of blending and nosing and mixing and creating their own alchemy towards Scotch whisky. So as we started creating blended Scotch whisky, that consistency came into the process. You knew that the bottle you purchased from your licensed grocer this week would be exactly the same as the one you purchased next month. And that meant that people kept going back and the brands began. So that's really the naissance of brands in Scotch whisky. And the reason that so many of our blends have the name of people behind them. So you'll have perhaps heard of Johnny Walker or Bells or Grants or Ballantines or Ushers, and I could go on and on and on and on. Um, and if you come and visit our beautiful collection here, you'll see many of the whiskies bear the names of an individual. And that's because they were originally that licensed grocer with their one individual shop in Aberdeen or Inverness or Edinburgh or Glasgow, creating their very own blended whiskey, which became so successful that they then started selling further afield, uh, initially to England and then overseas and throughout the rest of the world. And you see these incredible entrepreneurial characters who start traveling the world, um, the first traveling salesmen, the first brands. Um, all over the world to sell this wonderful new product of blended Scotch whisky. Now, before any of you out there say blended Scotch whisky isn't for me, I only like the single malts, uh, let me let you into a little secret. People that make the single malts are the master blender. So they're created and crafted in the distillery, of course, by the distillers and the distilling team themselves. But it's the master blenders who then visit the warehouses where the whisky is maturing um, on a weekly and monthly and annual basis to check the casks and decide what that whisky is going to be used for. So generally speaking, if you buy a bottle of single malt Scotch whisky, it tends not to be from one single cask. That is possible, but that's a very rare and, and limited edition type of whisky. So the usual single malts that you'll see will be a mixture of many casks from that one single distillery. But those casks must all have met the same flavor and quality and character that is desired for that expression, a 10 year old, a 12 year old, the 15, the 18. So there may be a cask that arrives at 10 years old that is, is beautiful in flavor and character, but just doesn't quite exhibit the same notes and characteristics that would be expected for that 10 year old whiskey and it's left to mature and go on and will be further bottled when it gets to 15 or 18 years old. So it's the master blenders that we need to thank for the very consistent quality of the single malts that we get. And the fact that you know, when you buy your favorite single malt um, on a frequent basis, that you're always gonna get that same flavor and character. Consistency. So the blends were a real seized of the opportunity. There was another uh, big opportunity that, that came along for Scotch whisky, and this was a really good example, I think, of our current times of 
adaptation to change, when things are going wrong in the world and certain industries are not working and failing and how you can make the most of something and move into it. So in those days, many of the drinks companies did deal with a number of different drinks, not just Scotch whiskey. Uh, towards the end of the 1800s, the 1860s, 1870s, I mentioned that those new whisky stills were part of the Industrial Revolution. And another part of the Industrial Revolution were the steamships crossing the Atlantic from Europe to America far more quickly than they ever had done before. This meant that the travel was much, much faster, but it meant that any unwelcome visitors boarding those ships could travel across the ocean very quickly. And one of those was an aphid called Phylloxera bastrix, which could not have survived the crossing in the olden days, but now, because the crossing was so short, managed to make its way across to Europe. The vines producing wine in the Americas had no ill effect from the aphid living on it, but the European vines were decimated and almost died to a measure. This meant that not only was there no wine in Europe for a period of time, but there was no brandy. And the blended Scotch whisky with this wonderful new soft, gentle and consistent character saw an opportunity to take over from the incredibly popular brandy and move into that market. So that was another one of those ways in which the Scotch whisky industry looked for resilience and ways of moving forward and ways of taking a very difficult economic situation and making the most of it. Many of the distilleries that we look at today uh, were born as something very, very different. I've mentioned St Magdalene's, which was the convent and then a hospital, and Lindor's Abbey. But many of the distilleries had different roots in them as well. As you wander around distilleries in Scotland, and I encourage everyone I know to go and visit as many distilleries as they can. And um, just now, some of the distilleries are slowly reopening to the public. But do you know what? To find out what I'm about to tell you here, you don't actually have to go in and take a tour of the distillery. Even just seeing them from outside will show you what I mean. So many, many distilleries were born of the fact that they were originally small farm distilleries. On a farm, obviously, you grow lots of cereals and crops. And one of the most frequently grown crops and resilient crops to the weather here in Scotland is barley. And that's how we ended up making malt whiskey from barley as the main cereal. But when you have a great crop of barley and you have more than you need, you then need to store it and dry it and make sure it doesn't mold and it keeps good. So you find something to do with that that avoids those problems. And using that barley and turning it into whiskey gives you a product that then lasts as long as you want. And in fact, as the days and the weeks and the months and the years go by, it gets better and better and increases in value. So many farms, if they had an excess and a fantastic harvest, would turn some of their crop into whiskey and then use that for bar bartering. They would often use it to pay the landlords for the, uh, for the lease of the land for their farms there. So as you go and visit distilleries nowadays, and one lovely example is the Balveni distillery up in Dufftown, um, the sister distillery of the very, very well-known Glenlivet, was born as a farmyard distillery. And as you wander around and you look at these distilleries from outside, you can see etched into the stones and the architecture of the buildings, the history of how they have developed. And often you can see the different ages of where the whiskey came from. So you'll see buildings that date back to the 17 and 1800s with very old stone in the style of old farmhouses. And then you'll see developments that happened perhaps in the late 1800s when the blending started and there was a real boom in the whiskey and industry and that kind of architecture, often lots of sandstone being used and the much bigger, more impressive buildings. And then you'll see other booms that happened, particularly in the, in the mid 20th century after the Second World War in the 50s and 60s when there was another boom um, with much bigger and um, more modern buildings at the distilleries. And usually these are all stitched together in the most higgledy-piggledy of fashions um, and show you in the architecture and the stones and the build of the site of the distillery all these different periods and how the distilleries have changed and grown over the years. So farms were one of the very, very first things 
where again, Scottish people have shown their adaptability, their vision to look to the future and to change what they do in the here and now to make it something that's going to give them a different future and a slightly different business moving forward. Farms are the obvious one, I suppose, but one of the most unusual ones, which I would also encourage people to visit, because it's one of the most beautiful I've seen, is Deanston Distillery in Highland, Perthshire. And that distillery was originally a cotton mill. So it's based alongside the river, the beautiful stream that runs by it. You can still see the wheels there. And the bonded warehouse was originally part of the cotton mill production factory and is the most unusual bonded warehouse that I have ever seen in visiting my distilleries. So again, that beautiful cultural architecture of visiting those distilleries is a fascinating thing to look at and see. And why I always try and encourage people, no matter whether you like Scotch whisky or not, to give a go of visiting us here at the Scotch Whisky Experience or visiting the distilleries, because there's so many more aspects to it beyond simply uh, nosing and tasting a glass of whisky. We've talked a little bit about the blends and um, some about the history of Scotch whisky. And now I'd just like to finish with a few stories of where we are at the moment in Edinburgh itself. So Edinburgh has a fascinating history on all counts, which I can't even begin to scratch the surface of, but it has an amazing history in brewing and distilling as well. Uh, one of the most famous aspects of uh, Edinburgh's distilling history is connected to a visit in 1822 of King George IV. So uh, no monarchs had been visiting Scotland for quite some time. You might know that historically there had been some political issues between the monarchy in Scotland and in England, but King George IV was welcomed by Sir Walter Scott to come and visit Edinburgh, to come and visit Scotland. He wore his kilt, he was shown round the city, and this was the beginning of new relations between Scotland and England. He visited Holyrood Palace, which if anybody listened in on the tickets webinar earlier, there was another um, opportunity to see behind the scenes there. And the only whiskey he said he would drink when he visited Holyrood Palace was the Glenlivet. The Glenlivet is a beautiful distillery located away in a hidden glen that takes a long time to travel to up in the Speyside region of Scotland. And the Livet is the river that runs through that glen or valley. The way that many distilleries get their names is from the name of the river and the name of the glen or the valley that they run through. And there's lots of glens in the Speyside area because there's simply so many valleys round about the River Spey and the tributaries that run into it. But the king requested Glenlivet and nothing else would do. And that was the whiskey he asked for. The hilarious fact is that the customs and excise officers had been trying to close down all the illicit distilleries in the Speyside area for centuries before this. There had been pretty bloody battles between the customs and excise officers, known as the gaugers, and the local distillers trying to distill illicitly. And the Glenlivet, you have guessed it, was at that time also an illicit distillery, but known as one of the very best quality whiskies that there were around. So when the king asked for that whisky, people decided that something had to change. So they changed the taxation, they introduced licence of the distilleries, and just a year later in 1823, George Smith of Glenlivet Distillery was the first ever distiller to take an official licence and distill legally under official licensing. He wasn't popular amongst his local distillers for that decision and, uh, and the story goes that he could not go anywhere without two pistols in his pockets to protect himself as his life was in danger. After that, of course, many, many distilleries were founded. Now the dates of Scotch whisky distilleries and when they were founded are frequently not as old as you might think. And the reason for that is the date that we have is the date they took that official license. It's not the real date the distillery was founded. It had been there for centuries before illicitly, but the official date is the one that they actually took out the license. So most of our distilleries officially set up at some point in the 1800s. So that whiskey was requested in Edinburgh, down the hill from us at the foot of the beautiful Royal Mile in Holyrood Palace. Now there used to be many, many illicit stills in Edinburgh 
one indeed even hidden in the vaults underneath the Tron Kirk. Um, 400 illicit stills were thought to be in operation in the 1800s. Obviously that all came to an end and for many, many years, with the exception of one large grain distillery, North British, in the Dalry area of Edinburgh, there has been no distillation in the capital. However, in recent years, that's changed. And this is another beautiful reawakening of the Scotch whisky industry. I mentioned that in the last 10 years, there has been a real uh, renaissance in the production of Scotch whisky and many new distilleries having been built throughout the country. And that Edinburgh is no exception to that. So we have three new distilleries um, which have been built and are currently in operation or about to move into operation at the moment. So Edinburgh is slowly becoming again that whisky gateway to the further areas of Scotland rurally as well. So Edinburgh as a whisky destination um, has been the case for visiting us here and for visiting some of the whisky bars and then making your way further north to visit the distilleries as well. But hopefully as this reawakening continues within the next couple of years, Edinburgh itself is going to become a lovely whisky destination in its own right. So I'm delighted to have been able to share some of these stories with you. Um, at the beginning, we mentioned that there was a Q&A session as well at the end of this, um, which I don't have sight of any of the questions. So we're going to go back and hear if there's some, some questions from people that have been listening that, um, that I can maybe answer just now. I might just have a sip of this paper. So if you have a glass before we do that, um, it's Flangeva, which is good health in Gaelic. Flangeva. Julie, thank you so much. That was really lovely and so many interesting stories. And we've got a bunch of interesting questions to counter those interesting stories. Um, so our first question is someone who said that they love a single malt and they want to know if there's a story or reason why blended whiskey was created. Yeah, so I think blended whiskey, it, it was very much part of this whole industrial revolution. So looking to try and find better and more efficient ways of doing things. So blended whiskey really only came about because they created this continuous still. So the continuous still is also known as the coffee still after its inventor, Aeneas Coffee, um, or sometimes the column still because it's made up of two different columns. It's all the same thing, continuous still, coffee still, column still. And without the invention of that still, there would be no grain whiskey, there'd be no blended whiskey. So it was part of this fascinating time in the early 1800s where everybody was looking to be inventive and entrepreneurial and creative. And there was these amazing engineers coming up with, with modern ways of doing things. And I don't think there was any area of society that was overlooked. So Scotch whiskey was one of them. We make Scotch whiskey in such a traditional way. Um, the copper pot stills and the batch slow process that's used to make single malt has not changed from the day it started five, six, seven hundred years ago, perhaps even longer than that. So it, you know, it was time to relook at it. It's not an efficient process. So the whiskey that we produce is not pure, it's not 100%. If it was 100% alcohol, it would have no flavor. It would not taste of anything. So part of the benefit of it only coming up to about 70% alcohol um, is the fact that you then have lots of flavor components in it. But it does mean that it's not particularly efficient. So people were thinking, how can we use this new technology, apply it to the whiskey industry and create whiskey more efficiently? They then realized that the spirit was a bit more neutral and lighter and milder and potentially lacked a bit of character. So that was a bit of a problem. Much, much cheaper to produce, much quicker to produce, but not quite as flavorsome. And the answer was just blend the two together. And that was when the magic happened and the alchemy happened. And of course, there is a never ending number of different recipes, if you like, that you can use to create um, different blended Scotch whisky. Okay. Um, and then this one comes from me. What whisky are you drinking? <gasps> ah, this, this one here. So I'm not going to reveal the exact name of it because okay. um, at the Scotch Whisky Experience here, we represent the whole Scotch whisky industry. I should have probably mentioned earlier on. Um, so we don't promote any particular brand. I've mentioned a few distilleries during my chat just to bring it all to life a little bit more. 
Um, but what we try and do on the tour, I was showing you the sense of Scotland room earlier, is introduce people to the single malts through the regions. So we'll take people through the fact that the, the lowland whiskies are quite light and grassy and citrusy with cereal notes. Mm -hmm. Highland whiskies tend to be floral and honeyed and quite nutty in character. Speyside whiskies are very fruity. And um, so orchard fruits um, and fresh fruits and even sort of richer, uh, richer dried fruits. Uh, a Campbelltown whiskey. Now, this, uh, I've not chosen well here because there's hardly any Campbelltown, so people can guess quite easily. The Campbelltown whiskey um, is on the Kintyre Peninsula on the west coast of Scotland, battered by the Atlantic. So lots of sea breeze and a really fresh quality, um, but but appleiness in the character and um, a lovely, lovely vanilla note from the casks as well. Mm. So this is the one I'm trying, Campbelltown whiskey. And the final fifth region is, um, is the island of Isla, okay. which I always call the Wild West, I love it. It's the, it's the island where we use lots of peat, that very young form of coal, right. um, to dry out the malted barley, and then it makes the whiskey really, really smoky and peaty in character as well. So quite challenging, not to everybody's taste, but that's the fifth one. So rather than, so, so we kind of try, especially if people are not big whiskey drinkers yet, we sort of go for those broad regional characteristics and then begin delving deeper once we get beyond that. Ah, okay. Um, so are all of the whiskies in the collection room Scotch? And which one is the oldest? This is another question from that. Yeah, so they are all Scotch whiskies. So um, the collection that you see around me here was collected by a Brazilian businessman whose name is Clive Vidas, who was originally gifted six bottles of single malt Scotch whiskies back in the early 1970s, late 1960s. So he loved Scotch whisky, but he'd only, in Brazil, he'd only ever heard of the blend, and his, um, his favorite was Johnny Walker. And he was known that when you went over on a business trip and you wanted to visit him, he said to me, when you're in duty free, traveling over from Heathrow to Sao Paulo in Brazil, bring me a bottle of scotch and then at the end of your day in the office when you're working here come up to my suite and we'll have a dram and enjoy the end of day dram together mm -hmm. so he was absolutely known for this it's like don't go without your bottle of whiskey and then you have a dram together at the end of the day so um a scots businessman went over and said to him look you're getting a bit of a reputation for liking your whiskey here. <laughs> These are the special ones that you'll never have heard of. And they were six different single malt Scotch whiskies from Speyside Highland and also the Isla area. And he said, don't crack these open with me at the end of the day today. Keep these, take them home and share them with your friends. Um, and Clive was so enchanted by these six amazing bottles of single malt that he never opened them. And those six whiskies began this whiskey collection that you see around us of just under 4,000 different individual and unique bottles of Scotch whiskey. So because Scotland was in his heart from the beginning of these six bottles of single malt Scotch, that was what he collected. It was purely and uniquely Scotch whiskey. And the second question, which is, which is the oldest one? Um, which I absolutely love. And if you'll give me a second, I'll tell you a very quick story about it, which was um, my, my biggest professional panic in my life story is related to that bottle. Um, so when we took the collection over here, when it came over from Sao Paulo, um, it arrived in huge wooden packing cases. And it had been packaged by a, a fine arts company that also did fine arts auctioning. They were seen as being the best people for looking after something very precious and packaging it up and shipping it. And it all arrived intact, not a single bottle damaged, everything wonderful, fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and we began looking at all the bottles and looking at their records and deciding how we would display it in this area here, how we would categorize it, what would be the best way of doing it. Um, but obviously, because the spreadsheet had been put together by a fine arts company, rather than anyone that really knew anything about whiskey, the way that it had been categorized and labeled had been pretty much by the, the largest word on the label of the bottle. So it, it wasn't an exact science. There was a lot of us moving things about, recataloging them, um, but it was such a huge task. And we thought we'd got there, we thought we'd got it right, and it was all in order, and it was all alphabetical, and everything was in its collections, it was beautiful. And, um, and then Clive came over for our official opening. And two days before the official opening, 
I was showing him around the collection and he was in the collection with it's a very sort of stoic, um, very traditional man's man person. But he had a bit of a lump in his throat and a bit of a tear in his eye and wasn't saying very much. And, and then eventually he said to me, where is my very, very oldest bottle in the collection? I said, Nobody's told us about that. What's your oldest bottle? And he said to me, oh, it's this bottle of Buchanan's Scotch whiskey and it dates back from the late 1800s. It's the only bottle I have that I know comes from the 19th century, it's the very, very oldest of all of them. Now, well, it's definitely here because everything's here and everything's fine. And I'll just, I'll, I'll absolutely find it for you. It will be here with all the Buchanans. There's lots of Buchanans whiskeys. It'll be with them. So he looks and he looks and he looks and he's very silent. He doesn't say anything. I don't know what I'm looking for, but he knows what he's looking for. And he's like, it's absolutely not there. Okay. So only another 3,800 bottles for me to look through <laughs> to try and find it. And he's, he's describing it to me. He's like, it's in a short bottle and it's brown and it's dumpy and it's a label. How am I ever going to find this bottle of whiskey? Um, I said to him, give, give me 10 minutes. And I thought, okay, so they had sent me through CDs with photos of the collection. I thought, if I can find how it was photographed in his collection and the other Buchanan's, maybe I can find it. So eventually I'm sorting through photo after photo after photo on my computer and I find the Buchanan's and see a bottle and I'm like that looks really old and I zoom in on it and I zoom in on it and I see that it's so old that all it says on the label is scotch whiskey oh, no. and then there's a small signature at the bottom that says James Buchanan and I'm like ah oh, that'll be under S then so I run through the collection look under S and right now here is this bottle of scotch whiskey that just says scotch whiskey I said, is this, is this the Buchanan's you're looking for? And he's like, absolute. So he, he wasn't worried at all. It was one of those moments when the, my heart was in my throat. I'm like, please don't say that somehow his very, very oldest bottle of Scotch whiskey had been lost. But I love that story because it's so fascinating because it's before the brand existed. This is the story of the one I mentioned earlier of when it's a licensed grocer and all they did was sell Scotch whiskey and their signature from their shop was at the bottom of the label so brands didn't yet exist they didn't exist and it became and it has become and is now still this huge brand of scotch whiskey and it just feels like such a precious bottle for us to have that shows that whole history of scotch whiskey and how it came from these tiny stores and these individuals using that ability to blend tea making that jump and saying, well, if I can blend tea, I'll give a go at blending whiskey. Let's see how that goes. Um, and, uh, and creating what have become these iconic and wonderful blended Scotch whiskies. So that's the oldest bottle. And from the labeling books um, from the archivist at the distiller, mm -hmm. they know it dates back precisely to 1897. And is that, that's in that room there with you? Is it? It is, is it yeah, is yeah, it? that's in there. That's in the whiskey here, which I sometimes have the pleasure of dusting very carefully with the white gloves. And it's like, who's going to dust that one very, very, very carefully? So, but it's still safe, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then I think right from the beginning, we saw you introduced us very briefly to a cat and one of the audience members would like to know what's the story about the cat, Pete? Oh, there's a lovely story about cats and distilleries. So this is just a beautiful example of what I mean about how just within the world of Scotch whiskey, and it's why I've worked in the world of Scotch whiskey here for 25 years, because it's, it's, there's nobody and there's nobody you can speak to that you can't find a little fascinating tale and story to share with them. So the distilleries obviously have a lot of cereal in the distillery, malted barley being used to produce the whiskey. So these huge trucks come along and they deliver the barley ready to be malted if they're still malting at the distillery itself, or the already malted barley from those centralized maltsters. Huge amounts of barley, massive, massive trucks, very little of it gets spilled nowadays, but a little bit does. Sometimes it used to be delivered obviously in sacks in that more traditional way, an old fashioned way. So when you're storing a lot of barley, um, there's, a, there's a lot of little field mice that see it's an opportunity for an easy feast. Um, rather than having to go around the fields or like somebody's done the job for us, here, here's a feast for the evening. So you always have a distillery cat. Distilleries, traditionally for centuries have always had their distillery cats and some of them are even quite famous so um, there's a beautiful highlands distillery in Creef called uh, Glen Turret 
and it's got the most famous distillery cat, which was called Towser, which lived to a ridiculously long age of 20 odd years and was in the Guinness Book of Records for catching the, the largest number of mice ever caught and recorded by a cat. Um, so, uh, so when we opened um, the particular tour that we run now a number of years ago, um, we know that we have quite a number of families that come and visit Edinburgh. Often, younger children, um, sort of below 13, aren't able to go and visit distilleries themselves because of the health and safety rules around the production. Uh, so we've always wanted to make sure that although we're about Scotch whisky and we don't market to families, if you've come all the way to visit Scotland and come to Edinburgh and somebody in your party is fascinated in Scotch whisky, we want everyone to be welcome in that visit as well. Mm -hmm. So we created Pete the Cat because Pete is of course like name like Peter, Peter, but it's got the double meaning of Pete that's the fuel that we use to dry the barley as well. So we thought, well, that's clever. Um, so we'll call him Pete the Cat. And we have a kid's audio trail where they can go around and hear some of the stories that are not about consuming Scotch whisky, obviously, but those fun stories told from the point of view of the distillery cat that, that we call Pete. So he's quite subtle around about the about the building when you see him, but I can see I can see one of one of the Pete's cat and mouse in the corner of the distillery here, that of corner of the whiskey room that I'm in here. So that tells the story um, and makes sure the younger visitors are entertained. While, um, while parents or grandparents or family are coming around and um, enjoying a dram. Oh, lovely. Um, speaking of enjoying a dram, uh, what is the best way to drink whiskey? Or is there a best way to drink whiskey? So um, there's, there's two best ways to drink whiskey. Um, my first best way to drink whiskey is literally however you like to drink it. Um, and most people, when they come and visit us here at Scotch Whiskey Experience, they're like, right, okay, that answer doesn't cut it. We want to know how people in Scotland drink whiskey, what the proper, proper way for Scots. So because Scotch Whiskey has become such a huge drink all over the world, it's consumed in all manner of different ways. You just wouldn't believe it. Um, so in Scotland, traditionally, it's been drunk more as a straight drink or with water, or maybe with a little bit of ice. But as you go overseas, where climates are warmer and hotter, um, obviously cocktails are much more um, popular than they maybe are back here in Scotland, and just long drinks as well. And the country that you go to, it's mixed with what their local soft drinks are. So um, in Asia and in China, it's mixed with green tea. Um, in countries where they have, I remember um, being in, in Peru, and they have their own cola called Inca Cola. And people were drinking scotch with Inca Cola, that, that was their thing. They're like, well, that's our, our mix with scotch whiskey that, that sort of blends the two of them together. So it's drunk all over the world in a myriad of different ways. Um, on a personal level, there's a few scotch whiskey cocktails, which I absolutely love and think are a real knockout if I want a kind of longer drink. Um, and old fashioned, particularly, I really enjoy. But if it's about actually trying to get the most flavour and character and depth from a whisky, um, there's a few little steps that we share with all of our visitors when they come through here. Um, everybody that comes through on the tour, we actually gift them one of these beautiful whisky glasses. So it's called the Glen Cairn whisky glass. And this was created um, collaboratively by a number of master distillers in the whiskey industry with the glassware company that produced it. So they came together, they spent a day together discussing and debating the very perfect shape and weight um, and character of a glass that would be used for nosing and tasting whiskey. So this is what they came up with. So when we talk people through Scotch whiskey, um, we talk them through the colour and that tells you a little bit about the cask that the whiskey has been matured in, how long it's been matured in the cask. Um, you swirl it around and then you can look at the body weight and how the drops run down the, cat, uh, the glass itself, which will tell you if it's light and it's going to be quite light on the palate, or if it's heavier and more liqueur-like and going to sit a little bit better as an after-dinner dram. Um, we then move on to the nose, and this is a, a part where you need to be quite cautious because most whiskies are 40 or 43% alcohol. And if you dive in too enthusiastically, um, you can just numb some of the sensors there and not really open up the whiskey in the best way possible. So here is where the age old argument happens about whether you should add water to your whiskey or not. Mm -hmm. um, it's hilarious. If you come to Scotland, go to a whiskey bar and line yourself up with some people who are obviously whiskey enthusiasts, 
they'll all just argue amongst themselves because nobody agrees on whether you should ask add whiskey, add water to your whiskey or not. Adding whiskey to your water is a whole different conversation. <laughs> um, but, uh, but if you add water, what happens is obviously dilute the alcohol so you can really get into all the different flavors and characteristics much, much better. Um, also diluting that alcohol lets you physically be able to nose the aromas and characteristics better. And people that drink bar, um, brandy are familiar with those big brandy goblets where you, you warm it up a little bit yeah. with the warmth of your hand. And so adding a little drop of, of water to Scotch whiskey basically does the same thing. It releases those aromas from the whiskey. Um, now, you may personally feel that you've killed the palate of the whiskey by adding the water. You don't like the flavor of it so much with water, but that is completely individual. So personally, there's some whiskies that I love with a little bit of water in them. I think it just opens them up. It makes them more fragrant and makes them more interesting. It softens them in the palate. Um, there are other ones, and um, for me, that's particularly whiskies maybe matured in cherry casks that are a bit heavier and richer, that um, I, I, to my palate, are better just as they are straight. So um, it's just a question of trying it your, yourself and seeing which whiskies you like straight, which you like with water, or in fact, if you're just one of those people that is like, do you know what, a short drink like that is just not my thing. But a whiskey cocktail or a long drink um, is, is the perfect way to drink it. And actually, whiskey is so flavoursome and so strong in character that in a cocktail or a long drink, you still get that lovely character of the drink coming through. So it's not as neutral or soft as, as some other spirits that you might mix that, that you then really lose the flavour of, of that spirit once it's mixed. Julie, I feel like <laughs> I was going to say, I think that's the perfect answer and the perfect way to end this experience. I think a bunch of people are going to go off and find themselves some Scotch whiskey to have a little sniff of from far away, of course, or test whether or not they like it with water. Um, this has been such a lovely experience. We really enjoyed the stories that you had to share. Um, to everyone else who did join us, thank you for joining us for Tickets Awakenings Week um, and for this virtual experience in particular. If you're already in the UK, you can experience the UK Awakens in person and you can visit tickets.com forward slash vlog forward slash Awakening Weeks for information on all of our Awakening Weeks, ex ugh, Awakening Weeks activities, including this one. So please, if you're in the UK, go and visit the Scotch Whiskey Experience. Um, thank you to all. Thank you, especially to you, Julie, for sharing so much information with us and for giving us a view of the Scotch whiskey experience. I'm sure, I'm sure we're all just dying to go and experience it for ourselves in person. Um, thank you to everyone for joining, and we look forward to finding more ways to culture with everyone again soon. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.